In 2005, two female police officers were shot whilst attending an emergency call. Sharon Beshanivsky lost her life. Her colleague, Teresa Milburn, was seriously injured. I heard a bang. Saw Sharon's head just fall to the right and then plop forward. This callous criminality shocked the country. The crime is horrendous. No, it doesn't get much more serious than this. This is the story of how their colleagues went to the ends of the earth to bring to justice the people who did it. Somalia, one of the most lawless places on earth. A roadblock is waiting to catch a fugitive. The man isn't wanted here. He is wanted 5,000 miles away in Britain. For two years, he's evaded justice, but now the British and Somali intelligence services are closing in. His name is Mustaf Jama, and he is wanted for murder. All they have to do now is catch him. The story begins two years earlier in Bradford, when a quiet November afternoon was shattered by an emergency call to the police. For PC Sharon Beshanivsky, a new recruit to West Yorkshire Police, it should have been a day to celebrate. It was her daughter Lydia's fourth birthday and a family party was planned. Her husband Paul had been looking forward to this day for weeks. Sharon had also swapped her shifts around because of Lydia's birthday. And then I sort of got, got me orders to make sure I'm home on time. Uh, for Lydia's birthday, sort of everything were organised uh, for a party, but and and Sharon says, "Well, I'll be home early, as early as I can." And I sort of went to work, and she went to work. Teresa Milburn was Sharon's partner for the shift. They were friends on their team, but it was the first time they'd worked together. It was a seven-four shift, uh, early as we call it. It was uh, briefing at seven o'clock, and briefing, and we got allocated as rules for that day. We were what we called uh, the task at care, driving around the hotspot areas of Bradford, uh, being proactive, stopping people, helping people, not actually answering any calls as such. Just 30 minutes before they were due off duty, a travel agent close to the city centre activated a silent panic alarm that went direct to the police control room. Anywhere. 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 We're going right past it, aren't we? Yeah, I suppose we better go then, aren't we? Yeah, we'll answer it then. And we set off. The decision to take the call would change everything. It was from Universal Express travel agents on Morley Street, just half a mile from the central police station. A CCTV camera captured their arrival. As we got there, saw two street wardens and they crossed the road over to us and says, um, there's something not right, um, doors are locked. So we crossed over the road. The two officers were now just moments away from tragedy. Sharon walked in front of me. I've immediately followed her and it's all I've been. A couple of steps, not, not far at all. Um, and 
She, she just stopped. She, she stopped in the doorway. Sharon's parents were here, all the kids were here, a few friends. They'd been here sort of most of the morning, organising everything and cake and, and all this for sort of Lydia's party. And, you know, sort of everything were more or less in hand, just waiting for a sort of Sharon to come home. I heard a bang, saw Sharon's head just fall to the right and then plop forward. And then she just collapsed. I saw an Asian man and I saw a gun and then I was shot myself. The impact spun Teresa down the street. She had been shot in the top part of her chest at point-blank range. She pressed the panic button on her radio. A code zero alert to all the officers in her division that she and Sharon were in trouble. Every officer on duty raced to the scene. Among the first was PC Nicola Smith, one of Teresa's closest friends. When you hear your code zero go off, it's like, it's like getting a bolt of electricity through your body. Whatever you're doing, you just drop it. Teresa came over quite broken. It weren't a, a clear sentence, a clear message that came out. It broken words. Not enough to paint the picture of what we found when we got there. Most Code Zero alerts are to officers under attack. Matthew Scott expected to find his two female colleagues in a fight. We pulled up at the side of the street and I remember looking across and just seeing Sharon laid there on the floor. It was Teresa just again laid on the street. And I could hear Teresa's voice, but couldn't really make out what was going on, but knew at that point that obviously something really, really badly had gone wrong. Teresa had blood coming out of her mouth. She would obviously know a lot of pain and she'd been shot, so the only thing I was thinking is that I wanted to keep her talking and I wanted to keep her conscious. And the thing that she said more than anything else is, how oh, Sharon, where Sharon, is Sharon OK? Chaos followed. Passers-by had also rushed to help. CCTV cameras frantically panned the streets for any sign of the gunman. At the travel agents, officers tried desperately to give first aid to their colleagues. I went up to see how Sharon was doing. And by that time, there was two officers already with her. We sort of uncovered and found where, where the gunshot wound was. There was no, no blood at all, there was just a small hole in the top of her chest. I could see that Sharon were being resuscitated at this point on the road and I didn't want Teresa to realise how bad that situation was. Another officer had come to join us and I moved his body to block any view so that Teresa couldn't see what was going on with Sharon. As Sharon and Teresa were rushed to hospital across the city, Paul and the family were still waiting for Sharon to come home. A car pulled up at the top of the drive and I sort of bought a police car and I sort of automatically assumed, oh, she's having to work over. So then police officer came down drive and, you know, the conversation will then, you know, can I have a word with you in private? You know, there's been an incident and you can have to come with me. He was driven straight to accident and emergency. All Paul knew was that his wife had been seriously injured on a call. I mean, everything was chaotic. There were sort of armed police there, there were police cars everywhere. And you were just thinking, well, you know, what's sort of going on? <laughs> Minutes ticked by. Paul waited anxiously for news. Doctor came in and uh, says, you know, they more or less then told me that she'd sort of been shot and she'd passed away. What had started as an armed robbery at a travel agent's in Bradford had ended in murder. 
PC Sharon Beshenivsky was shot dead at the scene. Her colleague, Teresa Milburn, was also shot at point-blank range and was fighting for her life. The man given the task of finding the killer of a colleague was Detective Superintendent Andy Brennan. There was lots of garbled messages at first because the city centre division that covered this were in a state of shock themselves. Two of the colleagues had been shot whilst attending an alarm. It was a little bit confused. There were things happening. Uh, Sharon had been removed, trees had been removed from the scene. All we knew at that point from the initial briefing was it appeared at that time that this was probably a robbery that had gone wrong. West Yorkshire Police has one of the most successful murder inquiry teams in the country. Every available detective rushed to Bradford for a briefing. One of the first decisions I made was, was a decision to go right back to basics. Let's re-interview all the witnesses, let's ensure we've captured all the basic CCTV, and let's do the basics that we would do in any investigation. The first lead came within an hour of the shooting. Witnesses had seen three men, an Asian and two black men, leave the travel agents and escape in a silver 4x4 car. This sighting was vital. Bradford was the first city in the UK to install Big Fish, a ring of CCTV cameras around the city that record every vehicle entering and leaving, as many as 100,000 images a day. On this screen here we have a map of Bradford, but not only is it a map of Bradford, it also contains every camera location that we have within the city. So for this instance, I've obviously seen the vehicle is on Marley Street, now I'm looking to see where it's left. All the cameras in between these places were checked, unfortunately we didn't locate the vehicle. However, we did see the car coming out of Ransdale Road and indeed it turned right onto Manchester Road. We were then able to check the cameras that we have located further up this road and we were fortunate enough to see this silver 4x4 vehicle. Now detectives had CCTV of the route the killer's car took leaving the city and could identify it as a silver Toyota RAV4. But they couldn't read the number plate or see who was inside. During the midst of our investigation, the information was filtering through. A member of the public had uh, given the partial registration plate, which then alters our inquiry somewhat. Even a part number was crucial. Bradford's Big Fish CCTV system included automatic number plate recognition cameras. All vehicles entering the city have their registrations recorded. The team entered the partial number plate into the database, but would it come up with a match? Obviously we had no time scale as to when the vehicle actually entered into the city. It could have been the same day, it could have been days before, we obviously had no idea. The computer trawled through thousands of number plates. After dozens of false matches, they had a hit. Here, the 4x4 is recorded coming into the city with its full number plate, WP05YTT, clearly visible. It's just 30 minutes before the shooting. Now detectives had to trace its owner. We realised quite quickly that it was a hire vehicle from Heathrow Airport. Uh, that vehicle and another one had been hired by the same people, so it was critical on the Friday evening, the Friday night, that we had detectives in the London area looking at who hired them vehicles uh, and what type of people they were. As colleagues scoured the country, Teresa was still in hospital. The bullet struck her on the chest, causing her left lung to collapse. She was lucky to be alive, but didn't know what had happened to her friend. I kept asking, now Sharon more. I remember um, Jez Barrett as inspector. I says, how Sharon? And I remember him saying, she's not good. I can't actually remember anyone telling me that Sharon were dead. I've been told since that the specialist came up to us at that moment and told us that Sharon were dead. I can't remember that. Sharon's family were all too painfully aware of what had happened. 
a day 